our next Nobel laureate, part of the International uh, Climate Change uh, Commission's report, who won the Nobel Peace Prize, uh, please welcome Penny Wetton. Do you mind if I put the lapel on you for the audio purposes? Thank you so much. Uh, great. Thank you, Fiona. Um, so I'm going to say a few words about the vital role of science it can play in, in society and how it's endangered. But I'm going to be drawing upon the example of my personal experience as a climate scientist. Now, I was drawn to science because of my curiosity about the world. Um, I wanted to understand this amazing place and, and what really made it work. And as you know, science is the only path to this knowledge. And I daily appreciate the tools it's given me to make sense of the world around me, not only in my area of, of specialization, but really in everything else as well. And I'm sure you have that experience as well. In my career, I worked for 25 years on climate change, mostly for CSIRO. Um, and my specialty was regional projections, the science that develops descriptions of how future climate of a region will unfold under different scenarios of emissions of greenhouse gases. For example, this sign shows that under a business as usual scenario, um, where emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases continue unabated, Australia's climate can warm by three to five degrees Celsius by the end of the century. Um, in addition, large changes in rainfall patterns such as drying, substantial drying here in southern Australia, increases in heat waves, rapidly rising sea level. But I wasn't always just a prophet of doom. Um, this very science can also inform an assessment of exactly how much of this climate change we can avoid by reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. And this was a very important message of the science. Um, regional, projection climate, regional climate projections are used by other scientists to assess potential impacts of a change in climate. Um, for example, it was more than a decade and a half ago that such work identified that our coral reefs were at immediate risk from warming, as were our forests from increased fire. Last summer and its aftermath sadly illustrate the accuracy of those predictions. With ancient forests, rainforests lost to fire in Tasmania, record high temperatures across much of Australia, and the worst ever bleaching on the Great Barrier Reef. It's a great pity that the science wasn't listened to sooner. Climate science is actually a great example of the role that science can play in society if it listens, but also, sadly, of the threats to the science. Creating these pictures of future climate change inform us of the risks posed by climate change in a locally meaningful way, and what we need to do to adapt to the levels of climate change that are now avoidable, and the benefits of reducing greenhouse gas emissions. As, and avoiding as much of that climate change as we can. Achieving these goals requires climate projection science to be as widely shared as possible. I've collaborated with scientists from disciplines ranging from health, hydrology, biology, agricultural science and others. And have put great value on these collaborations as I have on communication of my area's science with the wider public. Um, and I'm sure in many other areas of science it's, it's these areas of collaboration that can be particularly rewarding. However, although you might think that having such a wide base of beneficiaries would mean that this science was highly valued and supported, it can actually be a key threat to this science. This is because it's an exact excellent example of public good scientific research, where unlike some other areas of science, the beneficiaries are not isolated to one or two key industries or commercial clients. Such research is best funded by government. Yet, sadly, climate science and other public good science has suffered dwindling response, support from government. CSIRO's climate change research effort has declined in recent years as funding sources reduce. And 12 months ago would have as good as ended if not for the professional and public outcry over the agency's decisions. Um, indeed, last May, um, I, I, was at, I was at a rally at this very place that was trying to save the science that we need so much if we're not going to fly blind, blind into our climate change future. I'm sure many of you were too and I, I thank, thank you very much for your support of um, when CSIRO was under that threat.
Saving much, a fair portion of CSIRO's climate research was an important but small win compared to the much larger fight that our American colleagues now have on our hands, um, that both Peter and Barry are referring to, with their current administration's proposed slashes to um, climate change program, programs in a range of agencies. Apart from the impacts on American climate science itself, the global research community will greatly suffer as essential global observational data streams supported by US programs may dry up. And of course, a key reason why climate science is under attack is because it threatens many of powerful business interests, particularly the fossil fuel industry. Um, and this helps drive the prominence of climate denialists, which plague effective application of climate science in society's decision making. Um, so I might say that the science of climate projections is, is based on climate modelling which in turn is based on the laws of physics applied to the Earth and its atmosphere as heated by the Sun. The projections are also interpreted in the light of more basic understanding of the climate system, such as why climates differ around the planet, the annual march of the season, sources of natural variability such as El Nino, which brings droughts to us in Australia. So climate science, like other areas of science, is part of an interconnected network of knowledge interdependent and grounded in the laws of physics. We cannot reject the main findings of climate change science without necessarily rejecting more fundamental physical understanding of the Earth and its atmosphere. Understanding which is validated and relied on daily, such as in, in weather forecasts. The climate sceptics don't understand all of this or willfully ignore it. They view science as a collection of facts that they can attack one at a time with no concern as to whether their quibble over one point is consistent with what they may say about another. They, ha they have no responsibility for maintaining the internally consistent body of knowledge, um, as it is the job of scientists. It's thus almost impossible to engage with them as they don't play by the scientific rules. Nevertheless, scientists do need to engage as much as they can. We may never convince the denialists, but we, can't, we have to convince the wider public not to be persuaded by them. Yeah. This is a, another reason for strong public engagement by climate scientists and by other scientists, and particularly where pseudoscience poses a threat. The threat can also can be combated through increased scientific literacy amongst the public. Achieving this is a great challenge in the era of echo chambers and fake news, but enhancing science teaching in the education system would be a great place to start. Yeah. For all of these reasons, I greatly support March for Science's objectives of science education, open communication, expert-led policy and funding for science. It's great that you all are here supporting this as well. Um, and let's march. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you. Our suppression of scientific data. We must make sure that we don't lose the ability to measure and therefore people think the problem doesn't exist anymore. Now, uh, Adam, we're going to march to Parliament where there are going to be several more brilliant speakers, Terry Speed, Sherry Mayo and myself, and then we'll wrap up. But um, I'm now going to uh, suggest that we all follow the people in the high vis vests and march along to Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. That worked. <laughs>